Hey there, welcome back to the final part of this week's episode of Leading Our Own Way. I hope you found inspiration in our guest journey this week. Today, we'll leave you with some key takeaways and actionable insights that you can lean on. Now let's wrap up with some powerful lessons that can help guide you on your own path. Don't forget to tune in for a brand new guest next week on Monday. But for now, enjoy this week's. Please subscribe to the channel if you don't already as well. Have a great weekend. We'll see you soon. Well, what, what can you leave that's better? When you start belie- believing that your purpose is something that's more than just working on yourself, it, then everything else that becomes easier because that's actually it's actually what you're here for. Hmm. So um, uh, you you are just an instrument. You you you're not you're not this. You, you shouldn't be navel gazing too much. Do you have that gift? Then do you have a gift that you can pass on to others? Um. I'm not sure if it's a gift. Um, I, I would like to think that I I have an, uh, an insight as to seeing those strengths that are in others and, and asking them to put a magnifying glass on that in their lives. So if mm. I see somebody who uh, has a genuine passion or an ability or a skill and they underappreciate that, I, I, I definitely zone in on that and, and want them to um, be aware of that and to – Maybe turn their attention to that part of themselves more, uh, because I know that's where that's where happiness lives. Yeah, that's in that place. So um, that's um, um, so that that's maybe if there was a gift, that's maybe it. Yeah. Oh, well, there you go. I love it. Community, you're doing an amazing thing, and I love uh, uh, this. Will be in the intro when I bring you in because we, we're very deep into the episode and we've not touched on it. And I want, I want the, I, I want the, the viewers to understand uh, whether it's a, your purpose. I mean, is it your purpose? Is it a passion? Let's go into the community that you're doing in the present moment. I, I, and I would consider this as another path of how you're leading your own way. Yeah. Um, okay. So, um, so I, I've had a, a, a feeling about, community service for for a while and and I look have not not actually made endeavors to get myself involved in stuff I, I will say that but uh, I've taken opportunities when they're presented so I, I ran a, boat, a local business association at one point but I was casually invited along uh, to have a cup of coffee one day and then that one thing led to another and before you know it I'm, I'm, I'm running the organization and then um, uh, when it came to um, when it comes to this project um, again it's not something that I do I, I so I feel like in some part, sometimes the best best lead way to lead is from behind. You 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 don't have to be the one that's taking all the credit. As a matter of fact, sometimes your best work's done when you're not taking the credit. Um, and and you know, greater gift to others when you're actually giving them an opportunity to take credit. Um, uh, for and, it, and you might think, well, they are they taking credit for my idea? Well, look, they'll 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 certainly rub enough of their own stardust over an idea to make sure it's theirs by the time it gets out to the rest of the world, mm-hmm. and it will be a better idea for it. So, um, I uh, through the relationships that are built through being part of the business association and the people that I've had the uh, the opportunity to meet, um, uh, I'm blessed in that I can pick up the phone and speak to some people that have can make a difference uh, perhaps in some areas and uh, over recent times I I bought a property actually that was only a a couple of streets over from where my grandparents used to live um, when they first moved to Australia uh, back in 1956 and uh, and so um, this this area is like our old neighborhood I guess you might say and it's not too far away from where I grew up either and um, so it's a it's a very similar property actually to to what I grew up in. Um, so uh, we've got a, a, these properties that are side by side, and uh, they look over a, a, a railway station. And whilst we've been at the property, um, kind of fixing it up and uh, just doing work towards uh, uh, towards improving it, um, I became an obser- observation of the the just the horrendous behaviour that takes place in some of these common areas like train stations, and this is during the day. Um, Anybody that's unfortunate enough to live near a railway station would be pretty familiar with the constant thrum of a two-stroke engine, and and that just serves as a constant reminder that there's these little monkey bikes that go up and down the rail corridor, 
and those monkey bikes are teenagers riding along trafficking drugs, usually meth. So for all these poor people that are hearing these motorbikes in the distance, it's just a constant reminder to them that meth is being transported near their homes, near their children, where they're, where, where they're living. You know, it, it's, uh, it's depressing. Mm. You know, they know that. Um, when, when you look around railway stations, you see that the people use it as a, 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 an opportunity to behave badly almost, um, in particular young people. You find that uh, the people that are causing the social unrest are normally males, normally groups of males, sometimes younger females, but normally groups of males, normally teenagers, early adulthood. They're, they're, they're kids, in other words, that are, they've got tremendous potential. They're not living up to their own potential and they're playing up because of lack of opportunity normally. But either way, they're a social problem and, um, and uh, should be moved on and certainly away from those people that are trying to access opportunity. And one of the disadvantages, of course, if you happen to be a young, a young person growing up in one of these areas that's... You know, obviously not a great area to begin with. Um, so is the chances are that your school's probably not going to be that great. Um, it probably means that you don't have a lot of social support in that environment. But the good news is, is that if you could access the rail, then you're probably not more than three or four stops, certainly not more than 20 minutes away from a better school and a better opportunity. If you're a disabled person and you're reliant on the rail for affordable transport... Well, the biggest in, in employer for disabled people in most uh, most jurisdictions around Australia is the is the state government, and most of the jobs that are available for disabled people happen to be in the city, and uh, a lot of those people aren't taking those opportunities because the only way they can access it uh, affordably is via rail. But because of the behaviour of those people on rail and because of the social environment uh, and just general um, a, a sense of um, a, a, a complete lack of safety, uh, people avoid that. And so these people stay home in NDIS instead of maybe fulfilling their potential in a role that might make a real difference and have a real impact. And I think about all of those kids that are living on the downside of advantage that aren't accessing the best opportunities for education. And I, and I see those elderly people that aren't connecting with their communities and, and, and remaining in contact with their families because of a fear of, of using rail. And I think there, there must be, and given that we're a first world nation, certainly a better way of dealing with this. When you look at railway stations in Australia, in particular in suburban railway stations, they tend to be just uh, tin sheds on poorly exposed platforms. Um, they're normally heavily graffitied. Uh, the common they're, they're common areas that are poorly maintained, and uh, and as a result, encourage bad behaviour. Interestingly enough, uh, interestingly enough, there's not a lot of literature around how to fix this problem. Um, so we we've had to kind of start from scratch in a lot of respects and and borrow from other um, exercises like broken glass theory and the effect of graffiti, for instance, wipe graffiti off. There's probably a less of a chance of there being more graffiti there the next day. So there's something to that. Uh, there's something you can do in terms of behavioural mitigation, but there's also something you can do in terms of beautification. People behave better in more beautiful places. These places don't need to be ugly, and it doesn't cost that much more to make them beautiful and to keep them beautiful uh, doesn't cost that much more to make them safer um, and the opportunities of course of having these people being able to access rail so that they can improve their lives hundreds of billions of dollars uh, hundreds of millions of dollars can be unlocked in our economy through these people on the downside advantage being able to access the services the education the job opportunities that they need to advance their lives and then you've got the flow-on effect of the property values being nearby going up because all of a sudden instead of being an area you don't want to live near all of a sudden it's an area of opportunity you want to be near so how do you do that well You've got to make railway stations destinations in themselves. You've got to make them safe places and you've got to make them uh, active places. So for them to be active, there needs to be several layers of surveillance and and supervision. And uh, and so you can get that through uh, many ways and normally passively through uh, residential accommodation nearby. Now, residential accommodation nearby rail is something that some state governments are actually experimenting with at the moment. but. Um, great people to be near rail are, are the elderly. 
the noise isn't such an issue for one, but also the accessibility for them is such that it means that they can very much maintain their connection with their communities, their, their, their sporting affiliations, their familial familiar uh, connections, stay in touch with their doctor, keep those connections. That IP that we lose when we send our elderly and most experienced citizens onto the fringes of our suburbs away from established infrastructure when they get to a certain age is of tremendous detriment um, to, to it also means that these elderly people aren't able to take care of maybe grandchildren and the like as well because they're just it's inconvenient for them to do so so having them nicely located close to rail is, is great also good passive security for that space activating that space commercially so that you have those things that uh, every suburb needs, like uh, pharmacy, childcare. These are the services. Now, there's plenty of room around these railway stations in suburban areas, particularly those built after World War II. There's a very good reason for that. Prior to, um, in Australia, prior to, uh, nine, particularly prior to the 1930s, um, most suburbs were built in a grid pattern so if you look at topographically uh, at a map, you'll see the older suburbs are on a grid pattern. After World War II in particular, but um, the garden city started to pop up. Uh, Hampstead Gardens in the UK was a, the first example of, of this. And there was several examples in, in, in most capital cities um, in the interwar period. But then we started to see, after World War II, uh, crescents and cul-de-sacs start to emerge on our, as our streetscapes. And... As a result of that, rail became disconnected from uh, the rest of the suburbs. So there's not a great connection. The, the, in often cases, the rail is just basically, the railway station is just an appendage to the suburb, whereas it should be the heart and hub of it. And if we really do care about carbon emissions and we really do care about energy efficiency and these things, then Activating rail makes a whole lot more sense and integrating them into our sub suburban lives makes all the more sense. So after World War II, of course, well, the reason why we have crescents and cul-de-sacs is to slow cars down because cars weren't such a big issue before World War I. So, um, uh, so our, the way that our suburbs changed was such that they became very car-centric and the planners, as a result, um, ensured that rail well i don't even know if they thought rail was going to continue as a technology beyond world war ii and it was certainly neglected and um, so as a result now we've in australia we've almost got a third world rail system in in a lot of our suburban settings um, that's not serving the population in anywhere near the way that it should uh, with rail stations that are unsafe when they should be uh, hubs and, and and the hearts of our communities and providing the services that keep keep our um, suburbs alive. So um, so that's a project that I'm leading in at the moment, which is to uh, bring awareness to this and to uh, provide some inspiration to our urban planners and to um, our uh, to our people that are in control of our infrastructure at a state government level to consider in in, in um, to consider incorporating the rail infrastructure in with its surroundings and um, uh, integrating uh, these assets in such a way that it benefits everyday people um, in, in real tangible ways and unlocks uh, the lost opportunity that's currently sitting with our, within our communities. And, you know, there's no... There's no uh, it's no mystery to me that people are experiencing depression and anxiety when they're so disconnected and from from the things that really matter, from from their communities, from their families, from jobs, from the chance of a better life, from a, all, all of these things. And uh, we're more than happy to throw billions of dollars at NDIS mm -hmm. in order to try and put a big fat Band-Aid on it. But something like this um, uh, is a, a, in a very practical way uh, can address uh, many of the things that are associated with lost opportunity that lead people down that downward uh, psychological spiral. So, yeah. You're coming from a, a root cause perspective, aren't you, I suppose? Um, yeah, I, well, I think from a practical perspective, you know, when, when you look at something like rail, one, one, once it's ripped up, it never goes back. So it's there, and, and if it's there, it's probably going to stay there for a long time. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, for... for, for the most part, they're not going to get rid of it. So if it's there, 
why isn't it being optimised? Why is it being yeah. neglected? And, 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 and why is that acceptable? And at what point did it become acceptable? And why? And, and I think in part it was a, a general a sense that in the post-war period, rail would become obsolete. Personal travel would be the preeminent form of travel, which, you know, I've heard from urban planners that in the 1980s there was... Uh, there was a discussion around how many cars would be on the road and they predicted there'd be about 30% less cars on the road now than what there there is currently. Um, and uh, so, uh, sorry, that, uh, sorry that, that's not correct. That there was, uh, They predicted there'd only be 30% more cars than what there was then and there's something like 200% more cars. Uh, yeah. And so if you wonder why your streets are blocked and why... Uh, while you're struggling to get to work in the same time that it took you five years to uh, go to get to work, that's why. So um, we, we've got even relatively recently uh, developed uh, suburban settings that just aren't fit for purpose in 2024. But we've got this wonderful gift of, of rail that runs through, um, well, with within 10 k's of 80% of our population. And so given that so many people can have access to it why aren't we doing everything to ensure that people do have access to it and that it's not something that you do because you have to but sue because you want to you know it's it's actually the better option is to catch the train than to drive your car um and certainly if you're close to rail there's so many people that live close to rail that also it could just as easily catch the train to work, but don't because they don't feel safe. And yeah. and if you don't believe me, you know, ask your girlfriend or your wife, you know, or, or your daughter whether they feel comfortable in catching the train after the sun's gone down mm. by themselves. And the answer is likely to be no. Yeah. So. And how is this project looking now? Then how is it going for you so far? So um, it's warmly received, um, and what it is is we're unpicking a lot of old thought around this, and so it, it's not surprisingly it's not something too many people have given a lot of thought to, uh, and those minds that have turned their attention to it see a lot of potential in it. Uh, we've been able to establish partnerships with uh, several other groups that are looking to, um, for instance, um, uh, affordable. Uh, housing providers for for retired people. Then this is a huge crisis that'll that'll befall us all um, in the next generation or so. There just simply will not be enough affordable housing for those elderly that need it. And so provisioning now to ensure that those people have well, what is prime real estate right on the doorstep and minutes away from everything they could ever need and want um, is is going to be really critical. Um, so uh, there is there, there is a, a sense of urgency about that, I believe. Um, we hear about the homelessness crisis. Well, the, the greatest growth of homeless people of women 55 and over. Wow. So they're also the most financially vulnerable demographic when single. Yeah, wow. So, so we, we, we're, in, we're in this time where we've got the, the, those people that are socially the most vulnerable, the disabled women, um, those people that are potentially on the brink of homelessness, the social problems that will unfurl as a result of all, all of that are, are far greater than um, than we we really want to contemplate, and we can address a lot of that by by essentially um, addressing this issue here of keeping people connected to the people and the, the, the areas and the, the, the doctors and the, and the opportunities that they, they need to have a fulfilling life. Um, elderly people need purpose. They live longer when they do. They live healthier when they do. They're less mm. of a burden on the health system when they do. Um, and being part of the community, uh, remaining active in that community, serving the purpose of passively securing the area just by breathing, you know, is, is um, uh, sometimes uh, enough to keep people going. Mm -hmm. That's a, such a big project. It sounds huge and you've articulated it so well. Uh, do you have a team supporting you through this process? Um, only in those people that I've shared the concept with who have really taken the idea on board. So mm -hmm. they've become the team. I don't have any researchers or or um, um, activists or anybody that are, that are out there advocating for it other than those people that have been very receptive. So I, I, I do talk about this to community groups um, to raise awareness and uh, ask them to 
they if there's anything in what I've shared that resonates to take that up with people um, mm. who um, they know can make a difference. And uh, usually you see those people that do hold influence if they hear these ideas from several directions, then, you know, they'll, they'll generally, it, they'll be conscious enough and aware of it that mm. when the right person speaks to them that they'll be receptive and, yeah. and um, you know, ready to maybe take up the mantle themselves. So um, we're in that process of um, building some consensus that this is a good idea, mm -hmm. it's a compelling idea, and that uh, if the next stage is, is really uh, establishing a pilot so that we can, in, in the real world, uh, test some of these principles because, as I said, there's not a lot of literature out there, so um, we, we can't glean it from the book, so to speak. We've got to really go out there and, and have a proof of, a proof of concept. So um, that's the that's the next stage of this project. So we're, um, we're working with our stakeholders now to see if um, we can create that opportunity. And do, does does Parliament government government have a role in this? Do you have to work and communicate and have a relationship with them? In I've got a very make... empathetic uh, uh, local MP who's uh, uh, got a, a very a very strong planning mind and uh, has um, uh, is already shared a lot of these uh, views. So it's very um, fortunate to be able to propose the, the, this to him and for him to really clearly understand where mm -hmm. I was coming from and to expand e even further the concept. Um, so uh, in, in his experience and understanding of how uh, similar projects, to different but similar projects have, have, have gone. Um, so uh, his IP and enthusiasm has been invaluable and uh, he's taken up conversations which uh, I wouldn't be in a position to. So as, as I was saying before, you know, it's it's not my idea. Like it's a, something that's it occurred to me. It's not my idea. So by that I mean I don't think all of our thoughts are, are our own. Sometimes they just come to you, and you you don't know where you go when you go to bed at night. When you go to sleep, where do you go? You tell me. Mm -hmm. I don't think you can. Mm -hmm. So, so what what thoughts are going on there, and are you in control of them, or are they in control of you? I I don't think this is a, an idea that I've come up with. Uh, I think that this is an idea that's come to me, and I've uh, I've kind of worked through it consciously. But it's not a, it wasn't a conscious thought; it just came came to me. And so I don't feel like it's an idea for me to take any credit for. Um, but I do feel like it's a concept. If it's occurred to me, it could have occurred to anybody. And uh, I just happen to be that person that it, it struck first. But as I say, you know, John's um, my local MP. Um, he's also had very similar thoughts. Um, uh, there's other people that it's not going to resonate with. Um, but for those people that it does, um, my hope is that we can uh, build enough momentum within those stakeholders. Uh, well, build enough momentum for the idea for the stakeholders to feel that uh, this is just an idea worth trialling. And if we can get to that point and we can get to a proof of concept, then I, I, I'll be very satisfied. Um, and uh, if we trial it and it doesn't work, at least we gave it a go. Absolutely. Great mentality. And it's such a huge project. If, if there was a timeline attached to it, what would you be de your desired result in terms of time, getting, yeah, got, accomplishing your vision? Yeah, so I've got 30 years in my mind as a as a goal um, mm -hmm. to get um, the important things in my life achieved um, so I'm in no rush yeah yeah um, you know I think if anyone's listened to this episode today I think with how you sum up life and, and how you sum up fatherhood being a good person the things that I've certainly taken from you, and if it's just me who has, then this episode has been super successful. But I think we were able to take a lot from you in terms of how you live your life, how you lead your life, how you have uh, triumphed through trauma that you've come across. Meaning, I was referring back to your wife, Helen. Um, there's just so much we can take, and all those characteristics just put together. I think for me, what I've learned is you seem like to be whether it's your vision or not and it's come to you for a reason and i think that's with all those those pieces that have made into your heart and your soul in today of why you're the man doing this and i think you are the man that could make those changes um it's fascinating and i i'm I love that you're doing that because I, I think you've looked at it with your explanation from every single possible angle and we need more people like you doing that in the official role 
mm. of the MP. You know, my friend is used to be the state secretary to the education here, and he he's so passionate about it. And I know there's restraints within all of that, and the, the tick boxes and money and infrastructure and whether they can go through with certain things. But it sounds like you're on the right path to to com not only convince these people, but to take the project forward forward as well, physically and well. You know, I know you probably won't be digging it all out i don't mean it like that you know, you know what I mean? i'll get down there if they want me to that's great fine. <laughs> great yeah great mentality um thank you dave it's thank um you. it's been absolutely amazing and um it, this episode's gone into many many directions i never thought it would um mm -hmm. and i've loved it i'm oh, so I'm glad i'm so grateful you you articulate everything beautifully and uh i think there's a lot like every other guest that will be able to take a lot from each episode, no matter what they're going through, whatever they've been through, whatever they're doing purposefully. Let's finish it off with a question that I, I probably, yeah, again, I think I probably know the answer, but if you could put it into one simple sentence, if we can do that, because you do articulate things so well, way better than I ever could. But what is, what is your purpose in life? What would you say your purpose is? To be the, to, to fulfill my own potential. Drop the mic. Full stop, right? Yeah. What a beautiful way to end it. I don't think we need to end it any other way, Dave. Awesome, mate. Well, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Thank you for chat. Yeah, thank you for leading our own way. Thank you for joining on Leading Our Own Way. Sorry. And um, um, I love how you're um, leading yours and um, by the sounds of it, many others as well. And uh, thanks for being a great leader as well, by the way. Yeah. Thank you. I love that. Um, <laughs> thank you for everybody else who's joined us for this episode of Leading Our Own Way. We'll catch you on the next one. And uh, from Dave and myself, take care. Thanks for listening and watching Leading Our Own Way. So we can stay together forever and share more incredible journeys, please subscribe to the channel. That way you won't miss next week's episode and what that amazing guest has to offer to the world. Please support Leading Our Own Way. And we'll get you on next week's episode.